All right, so tonight um, our program is Top Predators of the DMV. We're going to be talking about um, predators that live in our area around Washington, D.C. We are certainly going to spend some time talking about those big classic apex predators that we um, love and are incredibly charismatic. Um, we're going to talk about sort of how their populations have changed over time. Um, but we're also going to spend a little bit of time this evening at the end of the presentation talking about some smaller predators that we um, might not think of as predators or often get overlooked because they aren't quite as charismatic or as big and bold and beautiful. Um, I think they're just as beautiful, but they just don't capture um, our attention in quite the same way. So I do want to make sure we draw a little attention to them. Um, before I continue, I just want to make sure, does anybody have any questions? Again, if you do, you can unmute yourself um, and ask those questions. If I don't hear anything, I'm going to keep going. I will kind of check in with you throughout our presentation tonight. We'll be together until about 8 p.m. And it is very unusual for me to not be able to see any of you right now. Um, so again, I'm just going to do my best to try and check in and make sure you're still with me this evening. OK. So definitions, right? Our first things first, what is a predator? Um, a predator is any animal that kills and eats another animal for nourishment. Um, and again, we're gonna spend some time talking about those apex or top predators, right? Those really big, bad animals, um, predators that don't have any other natural predators. So really they're at the top of the food chain or occupy um, this sort of unique spot in a food web where they eat other things, but nothing else eats them. Um, I also wanted to just define the word carnivore here. So a carnivore is an animal that consumes other animals for nourishment. And we have, when we think about carnivores, we have two types of carnivores, right? Our obligate carnivores, animals that eat other animals exclusively. So for example, cats, right? They only eat other animals. They're never gonna um, eat spinach or beans or, um, you know, anything that isn't an animal. And then we've got our facultative carnivores. So they certainly eat other animals they're meat eaters, but they might eat other things in addition. Um, and another word for facultative carnivore is um, an omnivore, right? When it comes to definitions, they really are the same thing. That's two different words um, to describe the same type of animal, right? An animal that eats a mix of other animals as well as any variety of things that are not other animals. Um, I do want to make it clear that um, there are carnivores that aren't predators, right? These two terms are not the same thing, right? Predator and carnivore are often used to describe similar animals, but they don't mean the same thing, right? So some examples of carnivores that aren't predators are common scavengers, like our, in our area, black vultures and turkey vultures. And then we also have predators who aren't obligate carnivores, right? So there are predators out there that are hunting for other animals and killing other animals for food some of the time, um, but not all of the time. And in our area, that includes animals like black bears, coyotes, raccoons, fishers, which we don't necessarily have in our area anymore, um, but certainly exist in some of the western areas of the state, um, as well as striped skunks and a whole host of other creatures. Looks like we have someone else who's joining us here, so give me just a minute to get them logged in. So you're going to see my side of things here. OK, so coming back over to our, our uh, PDF of our PowerPoint here. Um, over on the right, I did include a forest food web. It includes a lot of other terminology that we're not going to talk about tonight, but it's important to just kind of understand and know, right? Um, when we're thinking about where predators and where carnivores sort of fit into this larger system or larger web of life in our area. Right. We have got um, certainly our producers, right, our plants that convert energy from the sun into food and then our uh, our primary consumers, right, our herbivores that are eating those plants like our rabbit here and then our secondary consumers um, like our fox that might eat our rabbit and then further on from there. OK, all right. So we got things defined. I think we can move along quickly. Um, I wanted to talk about some common traits that predators often share, although you'll notice I included this word usually up at the top because there really isn't any set of characteristics that defines a predator. 
Um, there are characteristics that predators have, but they don't necessarily mean, um, you know, if another animal has those characteristics, doesn't necessarily mean that that animal is a predator. So it can be a little complicated, but there are some things that most predators have in common. Um, first, I want to talk about teeth, right? And that's uh, when we look at these three skulls in the middle here, we can see three really different sets of teeth. And teeth are usually a really good indicator of what an animal eats. And so they're going to give you a clue as to whether or not that animal is an herbivore, an omnivore, or a carnivore, and therefore a predator, right? So on the bottom here, we have the skull of a white-tailed deer, and you can see those teeth are flat. Right, all of those teeth look like our rear molars, right? They're flat and they're used for grinding food together. Um, deer actually have this gap in their skull that we're seeing here um, that allows them to sort of strip leaves off of trees. If you've seen deer doing that, right? They take that branch and they put that branch right in that gap and just sort of pull their faces or their heads along that branch and, and get those leaves. Up above our deer skull, we have a bear skull. So these are not to scale. Um, <coughs> excuse me, this is a black bear skull and you can see black bears are omnivores so they eat a mix of both meat and plants and they've got um, molars in the back similar to ours that are good for grinding food but then they've got some pretty serious um, canines here as well as incisors that are good for biting into food. Um, so those teeth really show that mix. Up at the top, we have the skull of a bobcat, which is going to look fairly identical to um, lots of other cat skulls, including domestic cats. And you can see all of those teeth are pointy, right? Even the molars in the back. And that's because all cats um, are obligate carnivores, right? They are predators. They are obligate carnivores. They're only going to eat meat, so they don't need teeth that are good for grinding. Um, leaves and twigs and other things, right, berries, they need sharp teeth that are good for tearing up um, meat and flesh. Over on the right here, we have some other skull formations that are often indicative of a predator. So this is the skull, I believe, from a wolf. And if you look on the top here, you can see this pretty significant crest on the back of the animal's skull. And for a lot of animals that are predators um, and carnivores, right, they're going to have this crest on the top of the skull called the sagittal crest. And it's where the jaw muscles actually attach to the skull. So for an animal that hunts and has to hold on to prey and do some really serious chewing, right, that sagittal crest is going to be really pronounced in that animal's skull. And if you have a pet dog at home, even though our dogs do eat a mix of things, so they're not obligate carnivores, they do have that pretty prominent sagittal crest. And you can usually feel it if you're giving your dog a pet or a scratch between its ears. Um, you're going to be able to feel that formation on its skull. Other things that predators often have, right, claws. Um, in this case, these are talons of the bald eagle, so sharp claws or sharp talons to help catch and subdue prey. Um, not all animals that have claws use them for killing other animals, right? Like groundhogs are a good example. They've got sharp, strong nails or claws to help dig. So there's all kinds of reasons that animals can have claws, but often our predators have them. And again, those claws or talons in the case of birds of prey or raptors are good for right, catching and killing animals. Um, some Predators certainly use venom to subdue their prey, so when we think about a lot of our snakes, that's the case. We're going to learn about some other animals this evening that use venom that we might not know about. Um, and then just kind of the sheer size of, it, of the animal itself. When we think about um, some of our top predators, right, they are large animals. And what we're looking at here is actually the paw of a mountain lion. So you can see the size of that paw compared to a human hand. It's pretty impressive. Um, our predators often also have excellent hearing, eyesight, and smell, but that's also true for um, species that are prey, right? Um, not certainly necessarily something that is specific to predators, but certainly helpful. If you're an animal that's hunting other animals for nourishment, um, you're going to need some of those things. All right, moving along. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the historic predators in our area that were here yesterday but are gone today. And we're going to start um, with the largest. We'll probably work our way from largest to smallest um, with our gray wolves, right? Gray wolves um, are the wolves that were here historically in our area that are no longer here today. Um, Gray wolves have one of the largest ranges of any mammal in the world, at least they did historically. So you could find them on lots of different continents doing their thing. Um, 
They are obviously pack animals. They are collaborative hunters. Um, they feed predominantly on elk, deer, bison, and moose. And that was true back in the day in our area. We didn't have moose here, but we did have elk and bison in our area historically. Um, and when we think about wolves in the U.S. today, there's actually what we consider three subspecies of wolf. So we've got our gray wolves that are, you know, that's the one that's pictured here, and they're the wolves that um, are out west uh, primarily. We've got eastern wolves that live sort of in very in the very north of the United States and sort of parts of Canada. And then in the southern U.S., we have red wolves, and all of these wolves are subspecies. Um, or I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. Great. Uh, eastern wolves and red wolves are subspecies of the gray wolf and there's lots of debate in the scientific community as to whether or not they're actually genetically distinct enough to be considered subspecies. So lots of debate going on there. The jury is still out and it sort of depends on, on who you talk to. Um, there are folks who are splitters and would like to sort of split them up into different subspecies and folks who are joiners and would like to kind of see them all be considered the gray wolf. Um, uh, the differences between those subspecies really have to do a lot with the amount of coyote DNA that you see uh, within those wolves. So our gray wolves typically have the least amount of coyote DNA, although they do still have some coyote DNA mixed in with their uh, gray wolf DNA. Our eastern wolves and our red wolves are going to have sort of a greater percentage. Um, by the 1950s in the U.S., uh, wolves were almost gone. They really, populations had been... Um, sort of condensed down to just two areas, right? We've got, taking a look at my notes here, there were populations left in northern Minnesota and um, on Isle Royale in Michigan. Um, and that was it, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about why that happened on the next slide, but, you know, their populations really uh, were pretty decimated. Um, in 1973, the gray wolf was listed as an endangered species, and things sort of began to turn around from there. Um, in the mid-90s, there were 66 gray wolves that were intentionally reintroduced to Yellowstone and parts of Idaho, and those wolves have proven to be pretty successful. So their populations have continued to grow since that time. Obviously, nowhere near historic levels, and we certainly um, don't have gray wolves here anymore and probably won't, um, but we do still have gray wolves with us in other parts of the country, which is great. Um, down on the left here, I'd love to talk about our mountain lion next. Um, mountain lions have a lot of different names, right? You may have heard them called cougars or panthers or catamounts. Um, I like to use mountain lion, but that's just a personal preference. They also had historically a very large range, um, most of the Americas. Um, but by the 1930s or so, um, we weren't seeing mountain lions on the East Coast anymore. I believe the last um, reports of mountain lions in the eastern U.S. were from the late 1930s up in Maine and New Brunswick in Canada. So they've been gone for our area for quite some time. Um, the decline in mountain lion populations is really tied to the decline in forests in our country. Uh, mountain lions really need places to hide. They are ambush predators, so they stalk their prey. Um, they do hide, and so they need places to hide. And forests are the place to do it. So as forests declined, um, our mountain populations declined as well. The subspecies, um, the eastern mountain lion, uh, was declared extinct in 2011. And much like our wolves, there's a lot of debate about uh, sort of who counts as a subspecies and are they genetically distinct enough to be counted as a subspecies. Again, it depends on who you talk to, but we do still have mountain lions here in the U.S. Um, in the 1960s, they went from being a species that was um, killed for a bounty, which we'll talk about in a minute, to being a managed game species. And so that really marked the turnaround for mountain, po mountain lion populations. Um, since the 1990s, we've seen an increase in mountain lions east of the Rocky Mountains. So um, as right, European settlers arrived, they sort of pushed mountain lions and pushed wolves west as you know, their settlements expanded west. And now that we're seeing forests return to the eastern parts of the U.S., um, we're seeing some of these larger species make their way back. And that's certainly the case with mountain lions. There are no mountain lions in our area, but again, they are making their way um, back east. And researchers who study mountain lions anticipate that 
within the next 25 to 50 years, mountain lions will have become reestablished in a lot of places in the United States. So maybe never in the Washington DC area, they do need a lot of forest and they're not necessarily gonna find that here. Um, but it's certainly possible that they might end up in the mountains in our state um, along the Blue Ridge, you know, we'll see what happens. But the prediction is that they are eventually gonna make their way eastwards again because they've already started to do so. Next up in terms of size, or next down in terms of size is our bobcat. Much like our mountain lions, our bobcats need forests, right? They are also ambush predators, so they like having places to hide and the decline in bobcat populations, um, again, is really linked to that decline in forest. Bobcats are much smaller cats than mountain lions, so they need less space, they need less food. They are obligate carnivores, much like mountain lions are, because they are cats, um, but they're relatively small animals. So they're about two times the size of a house cat, and they really pose no threat to people or pets. They kind of mind their own business. They are generalists, so that means they will eat a lot of things. Um, they typically prefer rabbits, just like their cousins, the lynx in Canada. Um, and they remain relatively uncommon in our area. So we'll talk in a little bit about the bobcats that have been seen in our area in recent years, um, but you're not gonna find a lot of bobcats around here. On the sort of positive side, much like some of these other animals that we've already talked about, right? Bobcats are seeing an increase in their population. So um, researchers believe that the population of bobcats in the US is about three times larger than it was in the 1980s. So we're seeing some positive trends happening here, right? And then finally, I'd like to include this little guy, certainly not an apex predator, but he is an obligate carnivore. This is a long-tailed weasel, and they are really secretive animals. So there's a lot that we don't know about them. Um, they are small but mighty, right? So they can attack prey that is two times as large as they are, which is an incredible thing. Um, and they prefer a variety of habitats, but because they're sort of secretive and oftentimes nocturnal, they are very rarely seen. So the last time a long-tailed weasel was seen in Arlington County was back in the 1970s. Um, a staff member over at Potomac Overlook Park actually saw one crossing the roadway. And it's believed that they are still here in Arlington County, perhaps um, on places along the GW Parkway in North Arlington, close to Gulf Branch Nature Center, um, but we really just don't know. We haven't seen any in a long time, um, and we don't have reports of other folks seeing them. So possibly here, <laughs> um, certainly not in numbers that you know we would have seen 200, 300, 400 years ago, um, but they are little ferocious predators that are still around, we believe. Um, moving right along here, how's everyone doing? Are we doing okay? I'm going to assume yes, because I haven't heard anything otherwise. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about why, we're, why we saw such a decrease in some of these larger predators in our area, and it's really tied to two things, right? The first is that loss of forest that I talked about, right? So habitat loss, right? Places for these large creatures to live. In the middle here, I included a picture that was taken um, in the early 1900s of uh, Tioga or Tioga County in Pennsylvania, which at one point in time was known as the Pennsylvania desert. It had been so deforested and was so devoid of life that it was known as a desert. And this sort of level of deforestation um, isn't unusual to this county in Pennsylvania, right? We saw this level of deforestation all up and down the East Coast, all the way towards the Mississippi River until we got to the Great Plains. And so as people, right, as European settlers sort of expanded westward and cut down the forests and made way for farms, right, that habitat that some of these larger animals needed, like mountain lions and bobcats and gray wolves, just disappeared, right? There wasn't anywhere else for these creatures to go. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other reason, especially when it comes to some of these larger animals that we had such significant declines in their populations has to do with bounty hunting. And that's what we're seeing in some of these images, right? This is from the Vermont Historical Society. You can see a gentleman in the 1800s with the mountain lion that he killed. Down below, you can see uh, trappers and hunters who are actually employed by the 
by the US government. Um, they worked for, I'm trying to remember the agency, the Bureau of Biological Survey, um, and they were hired um, to reduce the wolf population out west. So again, right, as the European settlers moved across our country, cut down the forests in the east, began to make their way westward, they encountered those wolves that remained in the west and some that had probably been pushed west. And as right, they expanded um, their farms and their domestic livestock, right, the wolves that were running out of habitat, right, became attracted to that livestock because it was some of the only food available. And so that wolf person livestock interaction um, became very you know, troublesome. And so these guys were employed by the US government to, to kill wolves. Um, but killing wolves for a bounty is something that goes way back to before we were even a country, right? Some of the first settlers um, who arrived here in Virginia, the first wolf bounty was enacted in 1632. So as early as 1632, you could kill a wolf and bring it in and get paid for that wolf. Um, and we're seeing that in these two acts here um, from the state of Maryland. So this one is from 1658, right, in Colonial Maryland. And you can read it. It talks about bringing a wolf to the commissioners who will pay you for that wolf. And the commissioners will take the tongue out of the wolf's head so it can't be, right, traded back in. You can't double dip. I mean, just what we think of today as being really kind of crazy and unethical in some instances. Um, but this was just kind of the way it was back then. And down here you're seeing a similar act from Maryland when it was a state in 1811. Okay, so the last bounty on wolves, I believe, dates to 1965. So it's not something that's super distant in our history. Obviously, it has a long history. It goes back to, you know, the very first European settlers who arrived here, um, but it has extended all the way into what we would consider modern day. Okay. So again, habitat loss and then and bounty hunting are the two big reasons that we lost some of these large top predators in our area. Um, we did hear some positive things though, so I don't want to leave you on a really sad note, right? We know populations of gray wolves and mountain lions and bobcats are all increasing, and there are some right predators that are doing just fine in our area, and we're going to talk about some of those now. So. Um, Coyotes I'd like to discuss first because they have a really interesting sort of trajectory. Coyotes are uh, traditionally a Western species. So historically coyotes lived between um, the Rockies and the Mississippi River in the Great Plains, right? Coyotes enjoy that sort of plain environment, right? They typically didn't like forest. Um, and they were kind of narrowed in, right, by some of those top predators that existed on either side. So as those top predators um, have been extirpated or eliminated from our east coast areas, our coyotes have begun to expand their range eastward. And at this point, coyotes can be found in all 50 states of the U.S. They first showed up in our area in the 1970s. So we were really sort of like the, the last stop on the east coast for coyotes to get to. Um, Coyotes in the west took two routes to get east. Some went sort of north up into Canada and then down into Maine towards our area and then others took the southern route and went across the Mississippi River and up. So those two populations sort of met in the middle here in Virginia and Maryland and Washington DC. Those coyotes that took that more sort of northern route interbred with some of our uh, eastern wolves on the way as well as dogs and so they are typically a little bit larger than the coyotes you find out west. Um, but I know there's been a lot of talk in the news, at least previously, about coy wolves and coy dogs and this mixed animal hybrid species. Again, I just want to highlight that both our wolves and our coyotes have a, a mixed DNA that includes both wolf DNA and coyote DNA. And um, data from 2014 regarding coyotes on the East Coast indicates that coyotes have about 65% coyote DNA, 13% gray wolf DNA, about 10% eastern wolf DNA, and then another 10% of domestic dog DNA. So they're really these mixed creatures and you know like we talked about our wolves as well uh, display that coyote DNA in their genetics. So as we begin to have sort of a better understanding of the genetics of these creatures, we start to sort of question you know who we consider a species and a subspecies and, and how that works. But 
know that all of the hype around koi dogs or koi wolves is sort of overdone and really all of our coyotes and all of our canids are very much a mix of each other in, in one capacity or another. Much the way that some people have Neanderthal DNA as part of their genetics doesn't make us any less human, just means that we've got kind of a mix going on. Okay, so these guys are not, our eastern coyotes are not any less coyote, right? They just have some wolf DNA and dog DNA mixed in. Coyotes have been spotted all throughout our area um, because they live in close proximity to people where we are. They, um, they are often nocturnal and very secretive, so you often won't see them. Both of these images were from trail cameras. This trail camera um, image comes from a group called the Anacostia Watershed Society that operates out of Prince George's County. And this coyote, I believe this trail cam was um, placed right on the border of Prince George's County in Washington, D.C. And you can see, I mean, there's no doubt that, that animal is a coyote. Over here on the right, um, this image, oh my gosh, amazing, comes from our trail cam at Fort C.F. Smith, and it was taken two days ago. So you can see, right, this is definitely a coyote. It is not a gray fox. It is not a red fox. This wheel that we're seeing here is about four and a half feet tall. So this is a very large animal. It is not a domestic dog that is 100% a coyote that is living with us. Um, because they're secretive, you might not often find them. You might find signs of them. So that's what we're looking at here in the middle. This is coyote scat or coyote poop. Um, and you know it's coyote poop because of the size. So unfortunately in this image, I don't have anything to compare it to. Um, but this scat is about was about as long as my shoe and I wear a woman's size eight. So you know that's not a domestic dog. It's full of fur, looks like rabbit fur. Um, you know, I don't know too many domestic dogs who are eating a steady diet of just rabbits. Um, and just the sheer size of it tells us that it is a coyote. So they are here, they're doing fine, right? They're all over the US at this point. Um, there have been concerns about coyotes uh, posing a threat to small dogs and cats. So I would encourage you, if you have a small dog or cat, to keep that animal inside or be outside supervised with it, just in case. Um, but, you know, we don't really need to worry too much about our coyotes. They're doing just fine. They've adapted really well to this sort of semi-forested, sometimes feels grassy, suburban and urban landscape that we've created for them. Our foxes are also doing well. We have two types of foxes in our area, the gray fox and the red fox. In Arlington, gray foxes are um, pretty rare. We don't find them very often. They're typically a little bit smaller than our red foxes and they actually have the ability to climb trees. They really prefer sort of damp, swampy wetland areas, which we also don't have a ton of in Arlington anymore. And so that's probably why we don't see a lot of them here in this county, but they are in the greater Washington DUC region generally and they're doing just fine. Um, again, both of these species have adapted really well to our urban and suburban landscapes. Um, gray foxes are native to our area. They have been here prior to European settlement. They were here. Um, our red foxes are a little bit questionable. So again, the research is still out on this, but I'll show you on some maps in a minute. Um, red foxes historically had a population in the in North America, um, north of where we are. And when European settlers arrived, they brought red foxes with them from Europe. Red foxes have a really global distribution. So there's populations of red foxes all over the world. So there's some debate out as to whether or not our modern day population of red foxes in our area is um, descendant from that native population or descendant from that population that was brought from Europe or a mix of the two. And it's most likely that at this point that they are probably a mix of the two, but we're not sure yet and the research and the jury is still out on that. Um, we talked a little about bobcat populations improving and we're certainly seeing that. Um, we have been seeing bobcats in our area, so this bobcat was captured on camera along Donaldson Run um, in 2017, so they're certainly here. The most recent sighting of a bobcat in our area comes from January of this year. It was spotted in the Palisade neighborhoods along the CNO Canal. Um, and so there is some belief that they're probably coming from Western Maryland, down the Potomac River, down the CNO Canal, and making their way here and kind of adapting just fine. Um, Unlike our coyotes, right, these guys, again, are relatively small animals and they really pose no threat to our pets. Um, they certainly, uh, you know, obviously you wouldn't want to try and approach or touch a bobcat. 
but they're certainly not going to be hunting people in any capacity. Um, they're here and their population seems to be expanding and growing, and so that's pretty exciting and positive news. Finally, I wanted to talk about domestic cats. They're adorable. I have one. This is my nine week old kitten at home, um, but those kittens grow up to be pretty ferocious predators, right? They're cats. They're obligate carnivores, so they eat meat. Um, if you have a cat at home, I would certainly encourage you to keep that cat inside or at least supervise it when it is outside so that it doesn't prey on wild animals. If it's a domestic cat that you're feeding, it should have no need to catch a wild animal. Um, research that's been done recently estimates that domestic cats kill between one and a half to three and a half billion birds a year and between six to 20 billion mammals. So that's small things like shrews and mice. Um, so we really want to do our best to try and keep our domestic cats inside. They're good at what they do, right? Um, but if it's a domestic cat that we're caring for, it'd be great if they weren't eating our native lizards and our native mammals and our native birds. There's definitely been a decline in those species um, in recent times. Obviously, it's not all related to domestic cats, but if we can remove that piece of the puzzle, that certainly alleviates a little bit of that pressure that those wild species are facing. Okay? All right. Just want to show you a few maps here, and then we're going to keep on going. Right? We've got a map here of um, wolves and uh, <coughs> coyotes. So this shows you the historic range of some of these wolves. I did include a little note here that gray wolves did occupy our area in the past, so this map doesn't quite extend as far as it should. But you can see the historic range of the red wolf subspecies, the historic range of the eastern wolf subspecies, and the historic range of the gray wolf subspecies, right? Um, again, right, gray wolves, their, their populations have really been limited to the west coast at this point. We do still find eastern wolves in this area, and we find very small populations of red wolves that were actually reintroduced to parts of the southeastern United States. So um, definitely reduced populations, but they are still out there. This map shows us the expanding range of coyotes over the years. So this is sort of the historic range of coyotes, right? Again, we talked about how they were predominantly in areas between the Rockies and the Mississippi River, although they did extend a little bit west of that as well. And as some of these larger predators have been eliminated in our area, and we've sort of really altered the landscape from being primarily forested to primarily urban and suburban, right? We've made a landscape that's good for coyotes and they're moving in and, and filling a niche that, uh, you know, we emptied a long time ago. So um, this shows us the known range of um, mountain lions in the United States this time. And you can see, again, they're expanding their range eastward as well. So again, originally pushed westward as European settlers expanded westward across the continent. And now sort of as we're losing some of that agricultural land and reverting back to sort of more forested areas in many parts of the country, we're seeing mountain lions expand their range eastward as well. So this sort of west pushed westward and now expanding back eastward um, pattern we're seeing in a lot of different species, okay? Um, and then bobcats, right? We see them all over. They've been all over historically. They remain all over. You can see here along the East Coast, we've got sort of a population that's missing. Um, and that's largely because this is a very urban area. Okay, so again, as we're sort of allowing some of our forests to come back, we're seeing more bobcats come to our area and that's very exciting. And then this shows us a little bit about our foxes, right? This is the um, historical range of the red fox in North America or part of North America. You can see it doesn't quite come all the way to Maryland and Virginia. So that's why there's some belief that the current population of red foxes in our area is likely the result of European settlers bringing those foxes with them um, for fox hunts primarily, and the current sort of population of red foxes being a mix of those two populations. And then our gray foxes, just for comparison, right, only occupy parts of North and South America, much smaller range than our red foxes, which we see really um, almost all over the world. Okay, 
Real quick before we end tonight, I did want to talk about some other predators that we don't often think of predators, right? We've got our aerial predators, our masters of the sky, right? Starting with our great horned owl, who is an apex predator, right? There is nothing else that eats great horned owls, maybe when they're babies, but once they're adults, right? They are the top of the food chain at night in our forest. Um, they are amazing creatures. Owls are um, carnivores, they are predators, they are adapted for that life, they have all kinds of amazing adaptations that make them excellent nighttime hunters that we don't have time to get into today. But I did just want to share with you that a great horned owl has a grip strength of, um, let me check so I get it right, uh, 500 pounds per square inch. So when a, a great horned owl uses those talons to catch its prey and all raptors, almost all raptors use their talons to catch prey, um, they are squeezing hard, right? For comparison, the average adult human has a grip strength of anywhere between 80 to 100 pounds per square inch. So these birds are incredibly strong and, you know, they're coming at rodents and rabbits and reptiles and amphibians with those amazingly strong feet. Our red-tailed hawks are similar, but they're doing it during the day. Um, they are not quite as common in Arlington as some of our smaller hawks are, but we do still find them and we find them year round. Just like our owls, they are um, incredible predators that are adapted to that life. They've got amazing eyesight, right? Really sharp talons, a sharp beak, incredibly efficient flyers, right? They really do the job. Um, I love to bring up dragonflies because they're so tiny, right? But they are uh, pretty ferocious predators at all stages of their life. So even when they are um, aquatic larvae living in our ponds and our streams, they are eating other insects, sometimes other fish. We're looking here at, um, on the left, a great blue skimmer, which is a fairly common dragonfly in our area. And then on the right, a dragonfly called a dragon hunter, which uh, predates primarily other dragonflies, including the great blue skimmer. So um, as adults, right, they, they fly around, they catch other insects, they eat those other insects. As larvae, these two have different strategies on how to catch other insects and fish and small creatures living in the water. Our skimmers um, will actually kind of hide out and use sort of hair-like structures on their body to catch the silt down at the bottom of the river, so they're kind of camouflaged. Um, you know, it sounds like we have somebody trying to get in, so let's let them in. Um, where our dragon hunters will actually sometimes bury themselves in that silt. And they're both ambush predators, so they're just going to kind of hang out and wait for another insect to come by and then eat that insect. Finally, we've got another aerial nocturnal predator, our most common bat in our area, the big brown bat. Um, they are awesome predators of insects of all kinds, beetles, moths, mosquitoes, flies, right? A female big brown bat can eat her weight in insects every evening. Um, and they are going to hunt in during flight. So um, a lot of bats will actually just kind of fly around and catch insects in their mouths, but other bats will use the membranes on their tail and their wings to sort of catch those insects as they're flying. And then it almost works sort of like a scoop or a funnel. They can kind of scoop that insect into their mouth. So I did a little research, tried to figure out which one big brown bats do. Um, there's no conclusive evidence as far as I can tell in terms of understanding exactly how big brown bats hunt, but bats usually do one of the two or a combination of both to be successful. Um, next up are some of our aquatic predators, right? Um, our snapping turtles are certainly apex predators of the water. Once they are adults, nothing else is going to bother them, right? They've got that hard shell. They have a ferocious bite. They've got strong claws. Um, although those claws are primarily used for digging, not so much for defense or for attack. Um, they are predators of anything that lives in the water or visits the water, right? Fish, reptiles, amphibians, they will even take baby birds, right? I have seen baby goslings and baby ducklings gobbled up by snapping turtles. Um, they are ferocious predators. We've got um, northern water snakes that are also predators. You can see this one here is sort of resting on this piece of wood at the bottom of the dock here and it's actually eating an American eel. Um, so it caught that eel in the water and now it's dragged that eel up onto this piece of wood here and is trying to figure out, oh my gosh, how am I going to fit it in my mouth? <laughs> right, our northern water snakes swallow their prey whole. They are going to eat a mix of things just like our snapping turtles, right, fish, 
um, amphibians, reptiles, anything that visits the water or is in and out of in and out of the water, right? They are going to catch it and eat it. Um, over here we have the skulls. Um, different views of a skull of a northern river otter. And I included the skull here um, so that we can put some of the knowledge we learned in the beginning of our program here to work. You can see they definitely have these sharp pointy teeth, even their molars are pointy. So we know that river otters are um, primarily carnivores. Just like our snapping turtle and our water snake, they're going to eat pretty much anything that they can catch in the water. It is um, unknown if they are still present in Arlington. They really need sort of wetland habitat and very clean water. Um, and so it's unlikely that we would find them here in Arlington County, but they certainly do exist in the greater Washington DC region in general. Um, and you do find them in some of our cleaner waterways and cleaner wetland habitats. Finally, we've got an example of a non-native invasive species, right? This is the Northern snakehead. It has been described as a ravenous fish, right? It eats everything. Um, I've got some numbers here that I want to share with you, and I'm awful at remembering numbers, so you're going to have to forgive me for looking at my notes, but I think it's important um, that we understand they are predators of primarily fish. They sometimes eat insects and amphibians, um, but research shows that in the Potomac River they're eating primarily gizzard shad, bluegill, American eel, and then sometimes dragonfly larvae. But a study done on the Blackwater River over on the eastern shore of Maryland um, discovered that out of the 21 species of fish on the Blackwater River, 17 of those species of fish saw a decline in their populations that has been directly attributed to the snakehead. So when we talk about the negative impact that invasive species can have on our native species, that's what we mean, right? So these guys are not only competing um, with other fish for resources in their aquatic environments, but they're also preying on those fish and having some really serious impacts on their population. Okay, they are ravenous. They are amazing predators. They're really good at what they do, which in our area is why we maybe don't like them so much, but in other areas, right, they would be very respected for that. Finally, tiny but deadly predators that we probably often don't think of as predators. I'm going to start with our little ringneck snake here. This is one of the smallest snakes that you can find in our area. They can be found in Arlington County. We find them here every fall at the Nature Center. The young ones make their way in. This is a young ringneck snake fit in the palm of my hand. Um, they actually are venomous snakes, so their venom cannot hurt you or me but that venom in their saliva can be used to subdue really small prey, right? Everything from insects to maybe really, um, I don't even know, I'd say small insects, earthworms, and grubs, right? They're not going to eat anything much larger than that just because they can't, but they're using that venom to subdue that prey and then swallow that prey whole. So such a tiny, cute little snake, um, but it is a ferocious predator in its own right. We do have fishing spiders in our area. We see them all the time here at Gulf Branch. There are actually baby fishing spiders out there at the pond today, which was so fun. Um, fishing spiders are amazing predators. Um, they have sort of fine hairs all over their body that actually allow them to walk on the water. So that surface tension allows them to just hunt directly from the surface of the water. They don't spin a web. They often don't hunt from land. They're right on the top of the water. And those hairs on their body also allow them to create sort of like almost like a bubble that they can sort of flip under the water and be under the water but still breathing because they've got this little bubble of air all around them. And this is the six spotted fishing spider. It can actually dive down up to 18 centimeters under the water to catch prey. So they're going to be catching insects, other spiders, small fish, tadpoles. Right? I have seen fishing spiders catch fish. It's amazing, right? They're going to catch those animals with their legs and then use their fangs, right, to subdue that animal and eat that animal. It's pretty incredible. We've got two insects here that use a similar strategy, very different insects, but um, use a similar strategy to catch their prey. So they are predators. This animal here um, is an example of a robber fly in the Acilidae family. I forget which robber fly it is. You'll have to forgive me. Um, and this animal over here is an assassin bug. And both of these animals have a long proboscis, which most of us are familiar with on our butterflies and moths. It's what allow them to slurp nectar from flowers. But for these two animals, they actually use that proboscis to pierce another insect. And then they inject a neurotoxin into that insect that 
that causes that insect's insides to sort of liquefy. And they use that proboscis to slurp right those insects right out of that insect that other insect and that's what we're seeing here right this assassin bug has totally captured this bee looks like maybe a carpenter bee or a bumblebee and has inserted its proboscis and is probably in the process of slurping out those insides our praying mantids are certainly beloved by some um, we have a bunch of different species in our area some are native to our area some are non-native they are ambush predators, like many of the creatures we've talked about this evening, and they will hunt for other insects mostly and capture them in those sort of preying arms that we're used to seeing that actually have like those structures along the side to help catch another insect, um, and they will eat that insect. So amazing, right? And then finally, I wanted to draw our attention to some of our smallest mammal predators, right? We've got our um, Eastern mole here, you can see it's got these long claws. They are not for catching prey, they are for digging those amazing tunnels in our yards. Um, but if you take a look at the skull of an Eastern mole, you can see that those teeth are the teeth of a predator, right? Who knew that a mole had a mouth that looked like that, right? They're catching earthworms, grubs, insects under the soil. If you've got moles in your yard, let them do their thing, right? They will take care of your grub problem for you. You may have to put up with some squishy spots in your yard where they've tunneled, um, but they can do no structural harm to our buildings or sheds, right? They're just not big enough to cause the same kind of damage that a groundhog might by burrowing. Um, so, you know, if you've got moles, let them stay. And then finally, I've included our Kirtland short-tailed shrew. Um, these little guys are often prey, right? When you take a look at what great horned owls and barred owls are eating in our area, you often find shrew remains in that mix. Um, but they are ferocious predators in their own right. They actually are part of a family of shrews that have venom that they deliver. So one of the, I think I'm going to say one of, but I believe that they're actually the only venomous mammal in the United States. Um, their venom is delivered through grooves in their teeth, so not through fangs, the way snake venom works. Um, but they use that venom to subdue insects and grubs and earthworms, again, that they're finding under the ground. So tiny, sometimes prey themselves, certainly not an apex predator, um, but definitely ferocious in their own right. Okay. All right. So we have reached the end of our presentation here.